Hi class, this is Dr. Palmer once again and we're going to be talking now about the two-party system and the two-party system in the United States is a product of historical forces our electoral system and the ideological consensus of the American people. It provides more political stability than a multi-party system and more choice than a one-party system. Our objectives uh, for this video are to analyze the two-party system in the United States compare the party system in the United States with that of other countries to describe party membership patterns in the United States here are the vocabulary you need to know minor party two-party system single member district plurality bipartisan pluralistic society consensus multi-party coalition one-party system if you're taking notes uh, you should focus on these uh, for vocabulary if you don't know them you should get to know them uh, stop the video, copies these down if you feel uh, that you need to, and uh, again, make sure as you're going through these videos that you are um, stopping it and taking notes and digesting what we're talking about. I go very fast, but I want you guys to, um, to get all of this uh, information, so go ahead and feel free to pause, fast forward, slow down, whatever you need to do. Does the name Earl Dodge mean anything to you? Probably not. Yet Mr. Dodge has run for President of the United States five times. He was the presidential candidate of the Prohibition Party in 1984, 1988, 1992, 1996, and again in 2000. One of the reasons Mr. Dodge is not very well known is that he belongs to a minor party, one of the political parties without wide support. The two major parties dominate the American system of politics. That is to say, this country has a two-party system. In a typical election, only the Republic Republican and the Democratic Party candidates have a reasonable chance of winning public office. So why a two-party system? Well, on the whole and throughout most of history, the United States has always been a two-party system. Still, it is true that in some states and in many local communities, one of the two major parties may be overwhelmingly dominant and it is also true that this may remain the case for a long period of time. For example, the Democrats controlled politics in the South for decades. Nevertheless, for the most part, our government has been characterized by two strong major parties. A number of factors help to explain why America has had and continues to have a two-party system. No one reason taken alone offers a wholly satisfactory explanation for the phenomenon. Taken together, however, uh, several reasons do make a persuasive answer. One is the historical basis. The two-party system is rooted in the, in the beginnings of our nation itself. The framers of the Constitution were opposed to political parties. As you saw in Chapter 2, the ratification of the Constitution saw the birth of America's first two parties, the Federalists, led by Alexander Hamilton, and the Anti-Federalists, who followed Thomas Jefferson. In short, the American party system began as a two-party system. The framers hoped to create a unified country. They sought to bring out uh, order out of the chaos of the critical period of the 1780s. To most of the framers, parties were factions and therefore agents of, of devi divisiveness and disunity. George Washington reflected this view when, in his farewell address in 1796, he warned the nation against the baneful effects of the spirit of party. In this light, it is hardly surprising that the Constitution made no provision for political parties. The framers could not foresee the ways in which the government system they set up would develop. Thus, they could not possibly know that the two major parties would emerge as prime instruments of government in the United States. Nor could they know that those two major parties would tend to be moderate, to choose middle-of-the-road positions, and so help to unify rather than divide the nation. the force of tradition. Once established, human institutions are likely to become self-perpetuating. So it has been with the two-party system. The very fact that the nation began with a two-party system has been a leading reason for the retention of the two-party system. Over time, it has become an increasingly important self-reinforcing -re reason. The point can be made this way. Most Americans accept the idea of a two-party system simply because there's always been one. This inbred support for the arrangement is a principal reason why challenges to the system, by minor parties, for example, have made so little headway. 
In other words, America has a two-party system because America has a two-party system. The electoral system. Several features of the American electoral system tend to promote the existence of but two major parties. That is to say, the basic shape and many of the details of the election process work in that direction. The prevalence of single-member districts is one of the most important of these features. Nearly all of the elections held in this country, from the presidential contest on down to those at the local level, are single-member district elections. That is, they are contests in which only one candidate is elected to each office on the ballot. In these winner-take-all elections, the winning candidate is the one who receives a plurality, or the largest number of votes cast for the office. Note that a plurality need not be a majority, which is more than half of all votes cast. The single-member district pattern works to discourage minor parties. Because only one winner can come out of each contest, voters usually face only two viable choices. They can vote for the candidate of the party holding the office, or they can vote for the candidate of the party with the best chance of replacing the current office holder. In short, most voters think a vote for a minor candidate is a wasted vote. Another aspect of the electoral system works to the same end. Much of American electoral law is purposely written to discourage non-major party candidates. Republicans and Democrats regularly act in a bipartisan way, a bipartisan way, in this manner. That is, the two parties find common ground and work together in, in this particular area. They deliberately shape election laws to preserve, protect, and defend the two parties the two major parties and the two-party system, and thus they frustrate minor parties. In most states, it is far more difficult for minor parties and independent groups to get their candidates listed on the ballot than for the major parties to do so. The 2000 presidential election offered a striking illustration of the point. Both George W. Bush and Al Gore were on the ballots of all 50 states and the District of Columbia. None of the several other serious presidential hopefuls made the ballot uh, everywhere in 2000. <clears throat> to this point, non-major party candidates have made it to the ballot everywhere in only seven presidential elections. The Socialist Party's Eugene V. Debs was the first to do so in 1912. The Socialist candidate in 1916, Alan L. Benson, also appeared on the ballots of all the then 48 states. In 1980, Ed Clark, the Libertarian nominee, and Independent John Anderson, and in 1988, Lenora Fulani of the New Alliance Party made the ballots of all 50 states and the District of Columbia. So too did Libertarian Andre Moreau and Independent Ross Perot in 1992. Every ballot contained the names of Libertarian Harry Brown and the Reform Party's Ross Perot in 1996. In 2000, Harry Brown of the Libertarian Party was on the ballot in 49 states and the District of Columbia. The Reform Party's Pat Buchanan made it in 49 states, Ralph Nader in, of the Green Party in 43 states and the District of Columbia, and the Constitution Party's Howard Phillips in 41 states. But most minor party candidates suffered their usual fate. They managed to gain the ballot in only a handful of states. American Ideological Consensus Americans are, on the whole, an ideologically homogenous people. That is, over time, the American people have shared many of the same ideals, the same basic beliefs, and the same patterns of belief. This is not to say that Americans are all alike. Clearly, this is not the case. The United States is a pluralistic society, one consisting of several distinct cultures and groups. Increasingly, the members of various ethnic, racial, religious, and other social groups compete for and share in the exercise of political power in this country. Still, there is a broad consensus, a general agreement among various groups on fundamental matters. Even given this overall consensus, it is certainly not true that Americans always agree with one another in all matters. Far from it. The nation has been deeply divided at times, during the Civil War and in the years of the Great Depression, for example, and over such critical issues as racial discrimination, the war in Vietnam, and abortion. On the other hand, the nation has not been regularly plagued by sharp political divisions. The United States has been free of long-standing bitter disputes based on such factors as economic class, social status, religious belief, or national origin. Those conditions that could produce several strong rival parties simply do not exist in this country. 
In this way, the United States differs from most other democracies. In short, the realities of American society and politics simply do not permit more than two major parties. The ideological consensus has had another very important impact on American parties. It has given the nation two major parties that look very much alike. Both tend to be moderate. Both are built on compromise and regularly try to occupy the middle of the road. Both parties seek the same prize, the votes of a majority of the electorate. To do so, they must win over especially, uh, essentially the same people. Inevitably, each party takes policy positions that do not greatly differ, differ from those of the other major party. This is not to say that there are no significant differences between the two major parties today. There are. For example, the Democratic Party and those who usually vote for its candidates are more likely to support such things as social welfare programs, government regulation of business practices, and efforts to improve the status of minorities. On the other hand, the Republican Party and its adherents are much more likely to favor the play of private market forces in the economy, and to argue that the federal government should be less extensively involved in social welfare programs. The two-party system works for the United States, and most Americans accept it as the only viable system. Yet in Europe and elsewhere, the two-party system is not the rule. Some critics argue that the two American two-party system should be replaced with a multi-party system in which several major and many lesser parties exist, seriously compete for, and actually win public offices. Multi-party systems have long been a feature of most European democracies, and they are now found in many other democratic societies elsewhere in the world. In the typical multi-party system, each of the various parties is based on particular interests such as economic class, religious belief, sectional attachment, or political ideology. Those who favor such an arrangement for this country say that it would provide for a broader representation of the electorate and be more re responsive to the will of the people. They claim that a multi-party system would give voters a much more meaningful choice among candidates and policy alternatives than the present two-party system does. Clearly, multi-party systems do tend to produce a broader, more divisive representation and diverse representation of the, of the electorate. At the same time, that strength is also a major weakness of a multi-party system because it often leads to instability in government. One party is often unable to win the support of a majority of the voters. As a result, the power to govern must be shared by a number of parties in a coalition. A coalition is a temporary alliance of several groups who come together to form a working majority and so to control a government. Several of the multi-party nations of Western Europe have long been plagued by governmental crisis. They have experienced frequent changes in party control as coalitions shift and dissolve. Italy furnishes a, an almost nightmarish example. It has had a new government on the average of once every nine months ever since the end of World War II. Historically, the American people have shunned a multi-party approach to politics. Two of the factors mentioned above, single-member districts and the American ideological consensus, seem to make the multi-party approach impossible in the United States. One-party systems. In nearly all dictatorships today, only one political party is allowed. That party is the party of the ruling clique. For all political purposes, it is quite accurate to say that in those circumstances, the resulting one-party system is really a no-party system. In quite another sense, this country has had several states and many local areas that can be described in one-party terms. Until the late 1950s, the Democrats dominated the politics of the South. The Republican Party was almost always the winner in New England and in the upper Midwest. Effective two-party competition has spread fairly rapidly in the past 30 years or so. Democrats have won many offices in every northern state. Republican candidates have become more and more successful throughout the once solid South. Nevertheless, about a third of the states can still be said to have a modified one-party system. That is, one of the major parties regularly wins most elections in those states. Also, while most states may have vigorous two-party competition at the statewide level, within most of them, many, uh, many areas are dominated by a single party. Party Membership Patterns Membership in a party is purely voluntary. A person is a Republican or a Democrat, or belongs to a minor party, or is an independent, belonging to no organized party, because that is what he or she chooses to be. Remember, the two, party, the two major parties are broadly based. 
In order to gain more votes than their opponents, they must attract as much support as they possibly can. Each party has has always been composed, in greater or lesser degree, of a cross-section of the nation's population. Each is made up of Protestants, Catholics, Jews, Whites, African Americans, Latinos, and other minorities, professionals, farmers, and union members. Each party includes the young, the middle-aged, the elderly, city dwellers, suburbanites, and rural residents among its members. It is true that the members of certain segments of the electorate tend to be more aligned more solidly, solidly with one or the other of the major parties, at least for a time. Thus, in recent decades, African Americans, Catholics and Jews, and Union members have voted more often for Democrats. In the same way, white males, Protestants, and the business community have been inclined to back the GOP. Yet never have all members of any group tied themselves permanently to either party. Individuals identify themselves with party for many reasons. Family is almost certainly the most important among them. Studies show that nearly two out of every three Americans follow the party allegiance of their parents. Major events can also have a decided influence on party affiliation of voters. Of these, the Civil War and the Depression of the 1930s have been the most significant in American political history. Economic status also influences party choice although generalizations are quite risky. Historically, though, those in higher income groups are more likely to be Republicans, while those with lower incomes tend to be Democrats. Several other factors also affect both party choice and voting behavior, including age, place of residence, le level of education, and work environment. Some of those factors may conflict with one another in the case of a particular individual, and they often do. Therefore, predicting how a person or group will vote in any given election is a risky business, which keeps the pollsters and the analysts busy until the votes are counted. 